Gravitational waves. What are they and where do they come from? Before we can answer these questions, we need to think about gravity. Newton began thinking about the force between objects with different masses, big M and little m, separated by a distance r. In 1687, he came up with his law of gravity. The right-hand side of this equation tells us where matter is, and the force F on the left-hand side tells us how matter accelerates through Newton's second law. So how is it that we don't get crushed and pulled through the Earth? Well, the answer is the gravitational constant, g. g is very small, and so thankfully, the force is actually quite weak. Let's skip ahead a few hundred years. In 1915, Albert Einstein came up with a new theory. He was trying to get his head around his own ideas about gravity and how he could reconcile them with his ideas about special relativity, in which when things move really quickly, our experiences of time and space become very strange. Einstein wanted to know what happens when objects move very quickly while also accelerating in a gravitational field. So imagine the universe as a rubber sheet or trampoline. If we take a marble and roll it across the surface, what happens? It travels in a straight line. If we now take a bowling ball and add it to the centre of the trampoline and once again try to roll the marble, instead of going in a straight line, we see that it follows a curved path around the bowling ball. It is accelerating towards the mass in the centre. Einstein imagined space-time to be like this trampoline, a flexible fabric of the universe that curves and dips. Larger masses would cause space-time to curve more and create bigger dips. Much like the marble on the trampoline, the Earth orbits the Sun, following the curved space-time around the Sun. So Einstein augmented Newton's equations with the new theory of relativity. Expressed in its simplest form, it's not dissimilar to Newton's equation. The right-hand side shows where matter is, and the left-hand side shows how space bends. Matter tells space how to bend, and the curvature of space-time tells matter how to move. We don't walk along the street and lean towards a big building, for example, because the factor g upon c to the 4 is very small. The effect is very, very tiny. But exactly how tiny is it? Let's compare space-time to some other materials. We'll start with rubber. It's a very stretchy material with a low elastic modulus of 0.1 gigapascals. Then the stiffness increases as we go from wood to concrete to steel. Finally, we get to diamond, the stiffest material on Earth with an elastic modulus of 1200 gigapascals. But how do these compare with space-time? Well, space-time has a huge elastic modulus, one billion trillion times stiffer than diamond. So it turns out space is not very stretchy at all. Despite the stiffness of space, it does still bend and stretch and squeeze. Let's go back to the trampoline with a bowling ball in the middle. Now we'll put another bowling ball next to the first one and move them around. We can see this causes the surface of the trampoline to wobble. Let's switch the trampoline to space-time and the bowling balls to black holes, the most dense objects we know created by the deaths of the most massive stars. As the black holes orbit around each other, we get a characteristic pattern of ripples. These ripples in space-time are gravitational waves, travelling away at the speed of light. But this stretching and squeezing takes energy. As this energy is lost, the black holes gradually spiral into each other, orbiting each other quicker and quicker until they finally merge and release a big burst of gravitational waves. A gravitational wave stretches and squeezes everything it passes through, even us. It stretches in one direction and squeezes in the perpendicular direction and then oscillates. The effect, however, is very, very small. So how do we go about detecting these gravitational waves? We use a number of detectors around the world. We have the twin LIGO detectors in the US, Virgo in Italy, GEO 600 in Germany, CAGRA being built in Japan, and another LIGO detector planned in India. These detectors look like giant L shapes called Michelson interferometers. A laser beam is split into two by a beam splitter. The two beams travel down separate arms of the detector and are reflected back by mirrors at the ends of the arms. They then recombine at the beam splitter to produce an output. When a gravitational wave passes by, one arm is stretched while the other is squeezed. Normally, the experiment is set up so that when laser light is recombined, the two waves are out of phase, equal and opposite to each other, resulting in destructive interference. 
but when a gravitational wave passes, the arms are stretched and squeezed, so the two waves vary in and out of phase with each other, resulting in a spot on the screen when the waves are constructively interfering. Because the effect caused by gravitational waves is so small, there are a lot of technical challenges in detecting them. Seismic oscillations caused by earthquakes, and even traffic, wind, and storms in the ocean cause the mirrors to move. Thermal variations cause the mirrors to expand or contract. The arms are under high vacuum, but there will still be some tiny air particles within the beam tubes that scatter the light. There will be quantum noise due to the fact we can't predict exactly when the photons will be emitted by the laser. And there will be variation in the power of the laser. These are just some of the technical challenges scientists are continually working to overcome in order to detect gravitational waves. <laughs>